You're back on the grimy streets of Whitechapel, all on your own this time, the chill of the night cutting through your thin clothing, but there's an undeniable sense of relief. Your heart pounds in your chest with a mix of fear and exhilaration. There's a rough road ahead, but it's yours, and that brings you hope. Your main concern, survival. You're a scrappy figure, rifling through refuse in back alleys or picking pockets in crowded marketplaces, and you're no stranger to hunger, but the gnawing emptiness in your stomach feels more poignant without your mother's comforting presence. Still, you're guided by the lessons she imparted, and each day brings a new opportunity to use the skills that she taught you. However, this does not go unnoticed. A group of men rough around the edges with a certain air of authority take interest in your abilities. They are the Monkey Parade Gang, a group notorious for their crimes across London and with a growing influence outside of their home territory of this Whitechapel. They are ruthless and allies to the Elephant Gang. You do your best to stick to the shadows, to ply your skills with strangers docked at Canary Wharf to the east. But despite your best efforts during one such early evening at work near those docks, pickpocketing docked drunkards who frequented the taverns, you are confronted. Your sense heightens and your fight-or-flight reflexes firing as the group surrounds you completely. You're approached by a uh, young man with sharp eyes and a sharper tongue, telling you that these streets are theirs and you're either with them or against them. Be a shame if you weren't with us, he says, tapping a hardened oak club in his left hand. He tells you your size makes you an ideal pickpocket and your street knowledge valuable. The offer brings a bit of relief. It's a dangerous path, but it's a means to survive with the ally of your enemy. You nod, accepting the twenty-something-year-old man's outstretched hand, your small fingers disappearing within his. His name is Lefty, and with that simple gesture, you're welcomed into the monkey parade. You're not alone anymore. You found a pack, and with the sun rising over the grimy streets of Whitechapel, you will bide your time and avenge the treatment of your mother. The group lives in various derelict places. During the early 19th century, a remarkable phenomenon emerged in the real estate market known as flash houses. These houses became notorious for their connection to criminal activities and their use as low-cost housing for impoverished individuals, particularly child gang members. In the absence of better alternatives, many found themselves forced into these dwellings, which became their only refuge from homelessness. In some instances, a single flash house would accommodate a considerable number of children, offering shelter to dozens who had no other place to turn to. The police, fully aware of the implication of these establishments, branded them as nurseries of crime. Testimonies from law enforcement offices highlighted the alarming conditions within these houses. For instance, in 1837, a witness revealed that a particular house in London was home to approximately 20 boys and 10 girls, all of whom were under the age of 16. Within the walls of these flash houses, the residents were under the guidance of a captain who actively encouraged and even fostered their involvement in pickpocketing and other illicit activities. Such dwellings became breeding grounds for criminal behavior, perpetuating a cycle of delinquency and social unrest in the Victorian era. The structure of the gang consisted of the captain at the top, which in the monkey parade was lefty. He had several junior lieutenants below them, the street bosses, and below that, the rank and file. The biggest indicator of separation between the rank and file and the upper echelon was dress. Street bosses and all up wore single-breasted, semi-fitted coats that extended to their mid-thighs. Waistcoats were generally collarless and single-breasted. Trousers occasionally cut from a narrow check cloth. And below that, high starch collars with cravats and neckties. Clothing was one of the end goals of any rank-and-file member, for it meant you had risen, and with that came a certain modicum of respect. For now, you were easily identifiable as a low-ranking junior, but you made the best of things. Snowing, which was the art of stealing clothing from wash lines, ensured that your mishmash of clothes was at least tolerable compared to the lowest denizens of the streets. Street bosses, of which there were several dozen, had a handful of street talents like yourself underneath them. Each group was generally comprised of about a half dozen individuals. In your crew, you would meet a diverse mix of characters. Burly Joe, the muscle known for his brute strength but unwavering loyalty to the rest of you. Thin and 
wiry Arthur who might not look like much, but he possessed a keen intelligence that made him valuable. Cunning Jack, a sly and also intelligent member of the gang, with a mischievous grin missing several teeth, substituted with cadaver crowns that hinted at his craftiness. Finally, Baldrick, dim-witted and mostly innocent-looking, but with a penchant for pickpocketing items of interest to him, all of you reported to Reggie Ironfist Blackwood, a former coal miner from the Black Country to the north. He had a glare that could curdle milk, but those who got to know him could see another side of him. Loyalty to his men above personal ambition. He had therefore been in the role for longer than most. With no previous jail time or major injuries, he had luck in spades, which didn't seem to run out. Your crew worked the southeastern streets of Whitechapel doing pickpocketing known to the group as dipping and a host of other activities whose slang you would learn over the next few months. There was a lot of livestock in London, and stealing it was called beak hunting. It was one of the primary methods of feeding the crew at the Flash House, as the less Reggie had to spend on food, the happier he was. Checking and quickly robbing basement doors was known as area diving, but Reggie discouraged this mostly, preferring instead the more upfront and in-your-face dishonesty of things like buttoning. This was setting up a cheat game in the streets for betting with no real ability to win for anyone other than the house, which for your crew was Arthur. This was something he excelled at, and he would travel from neighborhood to neighborhood in the south side as the rest of you plied your pickpocketing trades. Burly Joe was also quite handsome, and he would often scheme with some of the 40 elephant women in the art of bearing up. The more attractive and charismatic of the elephant women would flirt and tempt a man with the promise of flesh only to lure him to a secluded spot where Burly Joe would incapacitate and rob the poor fella. Over the years, you work your way up through the rank and file and along with it your appearance, now at 18, a stark contrast from your younger years, and a boxy frame many didn't challenge on the streets. Scars from multiple scrapes and fights cover various parts of your body and face. Always present though is the hatred for the gang and its ally, the elephant women. From 18 to 20, you graduate from pickpocket work and you run your own crew working heists on various shops and businesses in London, but the warehouses splayed across the Canary Wharf. Those are the prime targets. The first major job with your crew is one such warehouse. Jobs like this you learned were about subtlety and not strong-arming. Generally, information was obtained from porters and other unwittingly by leading them into conversation regarding the goods on the premises, the silks they have or other such goods, and to then find out the part of the premises where they were to be found. Sometimes a member of your gang would go in to inspect them on the pretense of looking at some articles of merchandise. In warehouses, you would also sometimes have one of yours slip in your closing time when only a few servants were left behind and were busy shutting up. He would secrete himself behind goods in the warehouse, and when Olive retired for the night and the door locked, he opens it and lets in his companions to pack up the booty. Should it consist of heavy goods, they generally have a cart to take it away. They are sometimes afraid to engage a cabman unless they can get him to connive at the theft and, besides, the number of the cab can be taken. Your men then get the goods away in the following manner. If consisting of bulky articles such as cloth or silks, they fill large bags similar to sacks and get as much as they think the cart can conveniently hold placed near the door. When the policeman is passed by on his round, the watch stationed outside gives the signal, the door is opened, and the cart drives up, and four or five sacks are quickly handed in by two thieves in less than a minute. When the vehicle retires, it is loaded and goes off sooner than a gentleman would take his carpet bag and portmanteau into a cab while the others walk off in a different direction. They close the outer warehouse door, most of which have spring locks. When the policeman comes round on his beat, he finds the door shut and there's nothing to excite his suspicion. The cart is never seen loitering at the door above a couple of minutes and does not make its appearance on the spot till the robbery is about to be committed when the signal is given, those steps being vital and the keys to a successful heist. The goods then being fenced and profits distributed up and down the ranks as required. Canary Wharf being disputed by many other gangs meant there was always the danger of a clash. One such fight occurred at the south end of the wharf, the Lambeth Boys. They'd been making noise about their rights to what was understood as neutral, fair territory. Shouts between members culminating in a meeting between Lefty and their leader, 
a larger, fat young lad named Ronnie Barker. With your lads opposite theirs, the two began their conversation, the exchange getting progressively more heated and animated until Ronnie spit in Lefty's face. Suddenly, a scrap broke out as Lefty returned the spit with a left hook, staggering Ronnie backwards several feet. Your heart raced as you flew forward with brass knuckles, the sound of weapons, hands, and feet filling the air accompanied by grunts and many curses. The scene was chaotic, but your gang fought with coordination and determination, sweat dripping down your face as you exchanged blows with one of Ronnie's senior boys, a tall, wiry, red-headed lad. A well-timed, albeit lucky, strike knocks him to the ground. You and your boys soon gain the upper hand as Lefty downs Ronnie, who is now laying prone on the ground. Two of his seniors grab him and his crew slowly at first begin to retreat until eventually it's a full rout with each of the Lambeth boys scrambling to save himself. Breathing heavily, you took in the aftermath of the battle, your gang standing together bruised, battered, but victorious. This section of Canary Wharf, serving as witness to one of hundreds of such battles fought over the years, now lost to time. Despite the risks, there were thrills. You relished the danger, the adrenaline that coursed through your veins when you were planning and then executing a job. You tasted the power and money that come with being a monkey parader, but you still had your end goal. The police, however, are growing increasingly aware of your gang's activities. More than once, you narrowly evade capture in the constant cat-and-mouse game that both sides play. You are also more frequently in the company of members of the Elephant Gang and their male arm, the Elephant and Castle Men. Your first meeting in the proximity of Mary showed she clearly didn't recognize you and your older, more mature appearance. Her and her underlings had gotten word via a friend of an elderly housekeeper for Baum Sons and Company on money stored in a safe they had on site. The housekeeper was frequently left alone in charge with only a guard dog on site. Baum Sons and Company, prestigious and wealthy, located at 58 Lombard Street, is the target. It was a building several stories high, with the upper stories led out to various firms and Baum Sons and Company occupying the ground floor and cellar where a strong room from brick was built. The information was that the tantalizing bounty was housed there, massive sums of money, numerous certificates, and a valuable collection of gold and silver watches. The treasure is irresistible, but the stakes are equally high. The building is a fortress, the strong room and even stronger fortress within. Security is tight, but the more you and the gang learn, the more you see the potential opportunities rather than the insurmountable obstacles. The building's occupants move with predictable patterns, offering windows of opportunity for those patient enough to observe and observe you and your gang do. The trusted housekeeper, for example, and her family residing in the uppermost floor, they could be worked around as they often left her alone on the premises for hours at a time. Over the course of several weeks, you and your accomplices plot and plan. Your band consists of the most skilled thieves in London, Jack Fingers Harper, the lockpick extraordinaire, Stan the Hammer Butler, renowned for his brute strength and agility, and Basil Faultless, master of disguise and deception. Skilled thieves that you had handpicked personally. Sure, there were other options, but this bunch, they had something to prove. Each had a vice of drinking to a stupor any time their lips touched ale or heavier drink. This had cost each of them in their own way professionally with the gang via missed opportunities. You would give them a second chance, and they were grateful. Basil had gotten close enough to the help on site to discover that there was but a single set of keys, and that set being transferred generally by Adolphus Baum to his brother, who in turn would give them to the father, the keys thus visibly being shared by all three. The keys were not left anywhere out of sight. Basil, having infiltrated in another disguise as a Parisian investor, noted that the safe was located in the basement with brick walls all along the foundation and the ceiling of the vault room. The street door locked at night from the inside and secured by bolts and crossbars. You watch the building for hours until the revelation dawns on you that you'd all been approaching it wrong. The solution was there all along in front of you. The housekeeper, she had her unit on the top fourth floor, and every evening when she retired, she would open a window for airflow. The gap, perhaps seven inches in height, maybe eight or nine, no more. 
too little of a gap for a man. But a boy, that could work. The exterior could be climbed, but would require a lad skilled in the arts of climbing and burglary. There were just enough decorative features in the brickwork at the lower levels, coupled with intervals of molding, ledges, and drain pipes, that it should be possible. This exceptional climber would require a snakesman. A snakesman being the person skilled in using children to plant in houses and then open said house after hours to let the thieves in. Perhaps the most skilled snakesman known to the Monkey Parade gang was Edmund Black, also known by the nickname The Adder. He had in his employ a select group of lads between 8 and 12. He would train one of the better climbers on buildings approximating the exterior layout and height of the Baum shop. His job, to climb and shimmy through the window and make it downstairs to open the exterior door, which even if bolts and bars were removed, would still be locked. This is where Jack Fingers Harper came in. He would be able to open the door by removing the lock in its entirety once the bolts and bars were removed from the inside. This would allow you all entrance. Two problems remained to be solved. One was gaining access to the interior of the vault room. As mentioned, it was surrounded by brick and a large metal door secured the entryway. Fingers had an idea here too. Rather than fight through the metal and the locks of the door, gain access instead via a hole drilled through the brick wall and open the door from the inside. The solution, while great, still left noise that could awaken the housekeeper and the guard dog, which had free reign of the premises, including the halls and passageways from the top floor down to the vault room itself. Stan the Hammer Butler had a solution. The child would bring with him a mixture of laudanum and molasses on a coated piece of treat, which he would first slip through the window after making scratching noises to attract the dog prior to crawling in. He would wait for the dog to eat and then enter once asleep. The next step was to add laudanum of a specific amount to the housekeeper's evening tea, which she would drink ritually as a nightcap prior to sleep. Your plan launches on a nondescript Saturday evening. As the Baum, Sons and Company closes for the night, leaving the housekeeper, the family did what they usually did on Saturday, leaving just her and the guard dog alone. The small boy, Ronnie Corbett, or Corby as he was nicknamed, scaled up the wall deftly after evening fell, reaching the small open window in just under ten minutes, even faster than had been practiced for weeks prior. He placed the prepared meat in the gap of the window and made a scratching noise before climbing back to the side of the sill and waiting. After 20 minutes dangling from the height, he tapped again, and this time, only silence responded. Entering, he made his way carefully and stealthily to the housekeeper's tea where he placed the contents of the tincture in her cup. Soon, both were asleep, and the boy made his way to the street access door, some minutes later. As he opens it, you four quickly step out of the shadows and inside as he exits and leaves. Your first task is to secure the dog now asleep with a short leash to the banister. You then make your way to the office above the vault room. You've got approximately two hours to drill through the brick, which is mainly the task of the hammer stand butler. He creates in just short of two hours a hole large enough for each of you to slip through and down into the vault chamber. Each of you with crowbar in hand, then remove the locks from the inner door of the vault as Fingers makes short work of the vault itself, you grab cash boxes and dump them of their contents which you quickly shove into large burlap sacks that each of you is carrying. Leaving no trace of your intrusion, you and your gang retreat. A makeshift latch installed on the inner side of the door is the final touch, giving the door the appearance of being locked from the outside. Should an officer pass by on patrol, you blend back into the seedy underbelly of Whitechapel, the audacious heist complete. Your reputation among the most cunning criminal minds of Victorian England sealed, and this a crime that would remain unsolved. It is a perfect crime, a daring act of theft that will leave the authorities confounded and the city's criminal underworld in awe. However, the final stage of the heist was to stay at an abandoned house prepared with supplies for several nights. You would then have a carriage arrive in a couple of days courtesy of Mary, which would deliver you all to an elephant flash house for splitting each person's cut. However, Mary would never see her cut, nor would these men allied with her. Sure, you had tolerated them, a, a means to an end, and you would ensure no harm came to them, but the money, that was the price they would pay, the price for your revenge. You would show these thieves no honor as no honorable actions were bestowed. 
for your mother on her deathbed those many years ago. Thus the exact nature of what was to unfold would be only known to you, driven and molded by this revenge over the years, a plan finely tuned over the last few weeks. Each of the sacks would be placed in the middle of the main room. You would then eat and drink before catching up on missed sleep from the evening's events. You had placed enough laudanum in the alcohol to ensure they didn't wake up for hours. Due to the bitter taste of laudanum, which tea in small doses could disguise due to its bitterness, you ensured only the latter portions of ale would have the dosage. You ate, laughed, and drank, and then drank some more, and after the drinking was done, drank even more, as you knew these men would. Each with their shared vice of drinking to a stupor would ensure the plan would be carried out perfectly. In all likelihood, the laudanum wasn't even required as soon the men were drunk and tired and looked to rest their heads. Soon, all that could be heard was heavy snoring. The laudanum would, however, ensure they slept for many more hours than they normally would. You took the contents of the burlap sacks, placed them into brown nondescript suitcases, prepared in advance for your group's exit. You tied each of them up and hauled the suitcases to the street side door. You then took out your father's old lever timepiece and waited another 30 minutes before exiting to meet a coach, which had pulled up just outside. After a 10 minute ride, you were dropped off at London Bridge Wharf. There you caught a steamship which brought you down the Thames and you eventually find yourself on the deck of a ship, the briny sea air filling your lungs as you watch the shrinking silhouette of England. It's a sobering moment, a turning point. You're leaving behind everything you've known, embarking on a journey to an unknown land. You clutch the flyer of New York in your hand, the paper now worn and creased from years of handling. As the ship sets sail, you turn your back on your homeland, your eyes set firmly on the horizon. America awaits, a land of opportunity, a chance to escape the past and build a new life. You're ready, more than ready. The future, it seems a little less daunting now.